The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be be thirsty. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. Loving God, make us hungry for the food that you give through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Friends in Christ, grace you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The other day, I read a story about a person who was jailed by the Russian government for reading poetry on a podcast. I don't remember all the details of what happened. I believe the poem was against the leader of Russia. And this I do recall. The podcast has four subscribers. Think about this. Despots know the power of words, and they often seek to control and limit what gets said. And as I've thought about that, apart from the simple fact of this censorship, it's fascinating to consider that some cultures find poets to be especially dangerous to them. And they're extra sensitive when poets step out of line. We tend not to value nor seek to understand poetry. We deal with things in prose most all the time. While we might enjoy some poetry in songs, we rarely open ourselves to poetry in meaningful ways. Few of us read it, and fewer still attend such things as poetry readings. In part, I think that might have something to do with a good number of our poets being out of touch with us and with our world, but that might well lead to a whole conversation, chicken and egg kind of thing. Do we lack poets who speak to us because we lack value, you know, well, whatever, um, At the same time, I sort of suspect that uh, there's a part of us that does not want to do the hard work of reading poetry, seeking to unearth the riches that can be buried in those words arranged in the way that poets have for us. It can take a good bit of effort. More than one of my professors in seminary encouraged us future pastors to read poetry. They thought that preachers who work with words ought to make poetry reading a regular part of their devotional life. They figured this would help us to pay attention to words and how words can help us to take note of realities in our world. 
a reality that might best be touched on with poetry rather than the rather linear ways uh, we often use to understand our lives. I think that's quite interesting. Now I have to admit that this is some of the great advice that I received in seminary that I failed to follow. It's interesting con to consider how language works and to wonder about how poetry might name many of the realities we face in our world. I think it can seem crazy to us that a poet get puts in prison while dictators know all too well the ways language can give rise to a hope that can overcome the empire. This month we are dealing with the riches of the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. Here Jesus proclaims that he is the bread of life and in rich language and powerful action God sets before us a call to freedom and life. And I think that we might most clearly hear what Jesus is calling us to if we understand this chapter as poetry, the poetry of God's love for you, calling you to live with a holy hunger for God's gospel love for all the world. Last week we began chapter 6 with the feeding of the 5,000 and the 12 baskets left over. This gives rise to a hunger in the people. They want more bread, which makes perfect sense. Jesus, in today's reading, critiques their priorities and seeks to turn them in a different direction. I wonder if we might say that Jesus is seeking to shape their hunger so that they might redirect their lives in pursuit of what really matters. Do not work for the bread that perishes, Jesus says, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Could it be that the feeding of the 5,000 and the conversation that follows are all part of the poetry of God's love, which multiplies five loaves into a feast for thousands and calls everyone to partake of God's generosity. This story is the poetry of God who feeds you with God's own love and gives you an abundance that our small minds really, truly cannot comprehend. Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. What must we do to perform the works of God? They say. And Jesus answered, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. And then they said, what sign will you give us so that we see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. It's interesting how Jesus criticizes them for the reasons that they follow him. And I think we should take note of a few things here. We probably all do that. Jesus, uh, follow Jesus from at best mixed motives. And second, after his criticism, Jesus proceeds to invite them to look for that which endures. Could it be that the people who chase after Jesus have been reading things in a rather prosaic manner? Have they missed out on the wonderful poetry of God here? They're caught up in simply getting another free lunch when so very much more is at hand. Is this not always the way of God's people? Do we not often fall into this trap and do we not continually need to be recalled, redirected, reoriented to the abundance of God's love, an abundance 
that surpasses reason and can only be communicated in the love poetry of God's passionate pursuit of you through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen for the poetry of God. Jesus has come that you might have life in God. This is so much more than we can fully comprehend in simple prose. Jesus has come that you may have life. Jesus sends you out so that, this might, so that this life might overflow in justice and compassion toward all. Jesus has come to give you the bread of life. And so often we simply ask for just a nice lunch. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I'm not much of a poet. I'm tempted to try to explain this image and make sense of it all. Yet perhaps this morning we should open ourselves to the poetry of Jesus and simply meditate on the good news that Jesus is the bread of life. This one who feeds 5,000 with five loaves offers much more than a free lunch. He offers true bread and true life. And so as you come forward today to take that simple wafer and dip it in the wine, Jesus offers himself the true bread, the bread of life, giving and sustaining, forgiving and renewing a manna from heaven and a meal that gives meaning and purpose, bread and wine, the gift of Jesus Christ himself. It is impossible to explain, and in many ways it makes no sense to try. What must we do to perform the works of God, they ask. Jesus answers, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. It's as simple as that. I am the bread of life, he says. You are called to participate in the poetry of God who loves you so much that God will give God's own self for you to live with you, to give to you all the riches of the kingdom of God. A poem of God who loves the world so much that God will give you to the world so that you might bear God's creative and redeeming love to all. Take and eat. This is my body. Take and drink. This is my blood. In the poetry of God's world, there is so much more than meets the eye. Amen.